Hi everyone, I'm Corinne. And I'm Brandy. Welcome to A Pod of Tales, the podcast where we read you short stories we made up and now you have to listen to. Every week we will each present a short story using the same genre, setting, and a challenge item to include. Everything else is up to our own interpretation. This week's genre is a mystery, the setting is at Niagara Falls, and our challenge is to include a nice pair of shoes. And disclaimer, we are not professional and our writing has little to no editing. We are just doing this for fun. Okay, so my I'm going first, and my story is in the Niagara Falls County, but it's not at the falls themselves. My story is called Mystery at Devil's Hole. Devil's Hole is a national state park in the Niagara Falls County in New York, and I've never been there before. Um, I was going to watch a video about it and then forgot, but Mm -hmm. I did some research, and you can find research about it when you Google it, and that's (laughs) what I did. I went on some um, hiking uh, websites and found some information about it, because all I needed was the basics. The title itself was intriguing enough for a mystery. And this is seven pages long, so bear with me. Maria and Haley had worked so hard working part-time jobs and babysitting this year for the chance to raise money for their senior year trip at the end of the school year. They were going with their class to Niagara Falls to not only experience the legendary waterfalls, but to hike around the different parks within the county and admire the beauty of nature. Maria wasn't as enthusiastic at the thought of spending their days surrounded by bugs and wild animals as Haley was. However, she was looking forward to the chance to have fun with their friends and not have to worry about schoolwork for a change. Haley was more of the explorer between the two of them and couldn't wait to specifically explore Devil's Hole State Park, where an elusive cave belonged somewhere on the trail. It is a landmark of a battle between the British and the Seneca tribe, where the British were handed a well-deserved defeat on a silver platter, and legend has it that if you take a rock from the location, you will have bad luck. She was more interested in the macabre and superstitions, while Maria would rather take the scenic background as an opportunity to boost her Instagram following. The first few days of the trip were filled with the initial viewing and exploring at the falls themselves. Everyone donned a plastic poncho and boarded the boat, ready for the tour. Maria had come prepared with a plastic sandwich bag to put her phone in for pictures. She hoped that it wouldn't ruin the quality of the photo too much, but regardless, she at least wouldn't have to worry about it getting waterlogged. By day three of the trip, they had finally made their way over to Devil's Holes State Park. The class was divided into a few groups for a few different hiking trails based on difficulty. Devil's Hole was the most advanced level in the options due to its rocky terrain and steep inclines. Haley was one of the first volunteers for this group and had spent the morning convincing Maria and their friends, Emma, Amelia, and Kate, to join her. Come on, it'll be fun, and we'll get to rub it in everyone else's faces that we did the thing that they all chickened out of, said Haley over breakfast. I don't know, replied Amelia, as she played with the food on her plate in discomfort. A lot of people have gotten hurt on that trail. It's one of the most difficult ones around here. We'll have Mr. Daniels with us. He's a gym teacher. He'll know how to help us through it, Haley insisted. And if anyone else ends up joining our group, they'll have to add another teacher to come with us. We'll be safe. So they think. (laughs) The girls looked to Maria for help. She just shrugged. She knew her sister well enough that there would be no talking her out of it, and they had all committed to being in the same buddy system for the whole trip. I think we can do it, Maria said to her friends. If we really hate it, they can't make us go any further. We can just turn back. After a moment of silent consideration, Emma spoke up first. All right, I'm in. Me too, added Kate. They all looked to Amelia, who just sighed. Okay, fine. This trail was no joke. A group of boys from the football team joined them, convinced that they were more than capable of conquering Devil's Hole. Brent, the team quarterback, led the group right behind Mr. Daniels, followed by the team captain, Chad, 
and a couple of linebackers, Jake and Mike, who were keen on letting the girls know when to watch their steps and to look out for obstacles. Mrs. Flanagan, a Spanish teacher, held watch at the end of the line. Haley was visibly irritated every time any of the boys tried to caution them. They're just trying to be helpful, offered Kate as Haley rolled her eyes. They think we're weak and can't do this on our own, she said as she started to walk faster. Haley, Maria moved toward her sister. It doesn't matter. We are all here on the same trail and doing just as well as they are. Jake had slowed down so he could talk to Emma and chad with Amelia. As Haley looked around, it seemed that Brent was the only one who had any kind of authoritative attitude about him after all, so she sped up to walk past him. Mr. Daniels, Haley thought quickly to think of an excuse to get up ahead of Brent. Mr. Daniels turned his head to see her meeting his gait. How much further until we reach the cave? She smiled internally as she saw the annoyance on Brent's face that she had interrupted their conversation about football. Uh, he squinted as if reaching into the furthest memory. I believe it's actually on the other side of the cliff up here. Can we see it? Haley asked eagerly. Um... Yeah, sure. I don't see why not. I think it's a little tricky to get to, so I'm going to test it out first, okay? Okay, she said. What's in the cave? asked Brent, now curious. It's the site of the battle in 1763, began Haley. The Seneca tribe saw this land as sacred and knew it well enough to care for it and protect it from the British, who of course wanted it for themselves. The British were outnumbered, even when they tried to recruit help in the next town over. They were wrecked. Over a hundred British were killed in that battle, while the Senecas claimed to have only had a single injury. After that, they were left alone for a few decades before another attempt was made. Wow, said Mr. Daniels, you know your history. I love haunted history, smiled Haley. Brent almost tripped. What? The cave is where the battle took place, she said. That doesn't mean it's haunted, said Brent confidently. Well, legend has it, if you take a rock from the cage... You'll have bad luck. That's dumb, he said. Well, then you'll have to try it out and see for yourself, smiled Haley. They descended the stone stairway, and thanks to Haley's previous research and Mr. Daniel's approximate knowledge from experience, they turned right off the trail and found the cave in no time. The opening was only about ten feet high and didn't extend as far back as Haley had imagined. She knew it wasn't massive, but she had hoped at the very least that it wouldn't be covered in graffiti and trash from partygoers. This is it. Maria asked as she caught up to Haley. You've been talking about this place for months, and it's not as big and scary as you made it sound. Haley walked up to the cliff rocks and put her hand on one and closed her eyes. Maria and their friends gave her a moment, but it was quickly cut short when Mike walked over. Hello! He shouted into the small cave. Haley snapped out of her meditative state and shouted back at him. What are you doing? Have some respect. For what, he asked, and as he started to laugh. It's a battleground, Brent said as he walked up next to Mike. Oh, so? Before Haley could outburst, Mr. Daniels cut in. So, we show respect for the dead and the Native Americans who fought to keep their home and then eventually losing it. And to show my respect, said Brent, as he started to walk over to the cave and search around the ground, I'm going to keep this rock as a souvenir. So I'll never forget about it. He's gonna die. <laughs> he held up a palm-sized rock as he walked out with a grin on his face. Put it back, said Haley through clenched teeth. Brent pocketed the rock, that smile ever growing. Before they could continue the argument, Mrs. Flanagan chimed in. All right, let's just get back to the trail and keep going. We have to meet up with everyone else by five for dinner. Mr. Daniels agreed and started to head back, once again at the front of the line. Everyone else started to follow as before, except for Haley, Maria, and Brent. Haley was glaring at Brent, who just waved them on. After you, he said smugly. Maria took Haley's arm. Come on, forget about him. Haley huffed, but didn't say anything else as she walked back to the group with her sister. Brent followed close by and then slipped the rock into Haley's backpack pocket as he surpassed them to meet Mr. Daniels at the front again. Haley had calmed down enough when Maria let go of her arm after a few minutes of walking in silence. Maria had gotten caught up in a conversation with Kate for a while and hadn't realized that she didn't feel Haley's presence behind her anymore. 
She stopped and looked around, first behind her, then in the group, and Haley was nowhere to be seen. Haley? She shouted as she felt her heart rise into her throat. Haley? Mrs. Flanagan was looking behind her as well now, bewildered. She's not up at the front? No, she was right behind me. Maria was becoming frantic now. Where did Haley go? Is she in danger? Is she hurt? All of these thoughts were frantically running through her head now, and the questions were getting worse as the seconds ticked by with no word from Haley. Mrs. Flanagan took Maria's hand and rushed to Mr. Daniels to tell him what has happened. Maria felt like she was going numb with fear as her friends rallied around her, <laughs> attempting to bring her comfort. They'll find her, don't worry. She'll probably come out of a hiding spot when she realizes we're all looking for her. But none of it helped. Maria was scared and confused about her sister and where she might be. She had stayed up watching true crime documentaries with Haley countless times and the number of people who have gone missing in the forest was alarming. If a serial killer didn't snatch her up, she could be killed by either wild animals or even just succumbing to the elements once nighttime hits. It was already almost five o'clock. They only had a couple of hours of daylight left. Maria was inconsolable when the teachers had to call off their own search in order to leave the forest and call the rangers to organize their own searches. It's going to be all right, Maria, Mrs. Flanagan said as they sat in the ranger's office. They're going to find her. People get lost all the time and are found safe and sound. But Maria could do nothing but cry. She leaned on Mrs. Flanagan's shoulder as everyone else in the group was interviewed for clues. Hours turned into a day, and Maria and her friends were waiting patiently in their hotel room for any word on Haley. Finally, a full 24 hours since the search started, Mrs. Flanagan knocked on the door with news. Not necessarily good news, but news nonetheless. What color sneakers was she wearing? asked Mrs. Flanagan. They were black, sniffled Maria through a tissue. They had blue shoelaces, though. She put them on herself. I thought so, Mrs. Flanagan lowered her head. Panic started to fill Maria's mind at that reaction. Why? Did they find her? Is she alive? No, they didn't find her, but they did find her shoes. Mm -hmm. Confusion broke itself on each of the girls' faces. Mrs. Flanagan continued, They found a pair of black sneakers with blue shoelaces placed neatly on the mouth of the cave. And that's it. Not a trace of her anywhere else. No footprints, no other article of clothing or items that she may have left for breadcrumbs. Nothing but the shoes. And now we cut to 20 years later. What? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maria never received any more news about what happened to Haley that day. She had to take a gap year after graduation from high school without her sister to go to therapy and get control of her life again. It took years for her therapist to convince her that Haley would want her to continue on in her life and to work towards being happy again. She hated how everyone always talked about Haley as if she was dead. They were twins, and even though they weren't identical, she had read and heard so many stories of twins having that telepathy that no one else seems to have with another person, and she knew that she had it with Haley too. She had always known when she was upset or hurt when they were kids, and even though it faded a little during high school, it was still always there. Maria would know if Haley was dead because she too would feel it. And she didn't. She felt like she was still out there somewhere. But the fact she felt nothing when the disappearance occurred cast a doubt in her mind and heart that she did her best to ignore. She couldn't give up hope. Maria was a teacher herself now, a history teacher actually. After Haley disappeared, she took up studying Devil's Hole State Park and its history and legends, partly to honor Haley's love for strange locations, but also to try to figure out who or what had taken her. As a strange twist of fate, her students had chosen to take their class trip to Niagara Falls this year, which was the 20th anniversary of Haley's disappearance. Maria had already volunteered to chaperone this year's trip and didn't want to disappoint her students, so she came anyways. She felt she was ready to face the cave again. Brent was also a teacher now, at their same school, and he was the gym teacher and football coach. He also was chaperoning the trip this year and was made aware that Maria was too. Despite working at the same school, Brent had always avoided having to speak to her. He was a social guy who loved getting along with everyone, but he never felt like he could face her, not after what had happened to Haley. 
Even after all these years, he still blamed himself for her disappearance. Because it is his fault. <laughs> he slipped the rock in her pocket. That's right. He should have never taken that rock and slipped it into her bag. She was right. It only brought bad luck, and he was too much of a hothead as a teenager to listen. Brent had been back to Devil's Hole State Park many times over the years, hoping to find a clue to finding Haley, but always coming out empty-handed. So now that they were back there like they were all those years ago on a school trip, he was the first volunteer as a hiking guide for Devil's Hole, and to his utter astonishment, Maria also volunteered. As the students chose which trail to hike, Maria and Brent had a moment to catch up. Hi, Brent, began Maria quietly. Hi, Maria, he said, holding back a few tears. He knew this day of confrontation would come eventually, but he was never ready for it. Isn't it strange to be back here in these circumstances, she asked. Yes, it is, he began, 20 years later. You remember the anniversary, she asked curiously. Of course I do, I was there too, remember? It came out harsher than he intended, so he digressed. Sorry, I just mean that I couldn't forget even if I wanted to. And honestly, it's haunted me all these years. I wish I could have done more to help find her. Oh, no. Maria put her hand on his shoulder. We were kids, Brent. There was nothing any of us could have done. Mrs. Flanagan didn't even see anything, and she was the one watching all of us at the back of the line. Brent sighed. Yeah... I know you're right, but I don't know if I'll ever shake that feeling. That I can understand, she said. When they had their groups, they set off and agreed to meet up at dinner at five. Brent led their group of ten kids through the trail while Maria took watch at the back. It was eerie being back here for Maria, following the same steps as they did in what felt like a lifetime ago. They told the kids of the history of the cage, and even Maria was impressed by how much Brent remembered from Haley's telling. They told them about the cave and that they were heading there now, but were scolded in a passionate speech from Brent to leave the rocks where they lie. Just like they did 20 years prior, they descended the steps and took a right. The kids didn't believe them at first that the cave was there until they came upon it. Brent led them over as Maria stood there for a moment, suddenly having all the memories flooding back to her at once, and then picturing Haley's shoes just neatly sitting at the entrance of the cave like she had seen in the photos. Of course, they weren't there anymore, but she could see them clearly in her mind's eye. Maria walked over to Brent as the kids walked in and out and around the cave. You know, he said quietly as his voice began to shake, I took a rock from here and she had warned me not to. I know, Maria said, but it was just a rock. You didn't have the bad luck that she talked about. You graduated, went to college, got married, and had a family. You have had a great life, Brent. It was just a superstition. I don't think she even believed. Maria smiled at him reassuringly, but he just hung his head. I put it in her back pocket, he said so quietly. Maria almost didn't hear him. What? When I walked by you two, I slipped the rock into her bag, and then the next thing we knew, she was gone. Tears started to well up in his eyes, and he couldn't hold it in anymore. Years of regret was now catching up to him, and he turned to face the trees so the kids wouldn't see him. Brent, Maria started. Brent, listen to me. That rock had nothing to do with what happened. Uh, Mr. Peterson? One of the students started backing out of the cave, and the others followed suit. Mrs. Hendricks? Another called as she ran over to them. I think we should go. Someone was in the cave, and I think they were hiding because we thought there was no one in there when we went in. Brent lifted his head and turned back around to see all the kids running over to them. Everyone stay right there. I'll go check it out. Be careful, Maria called after him as she gathered the students behind her. As Brent reached the entrance of the cave, a barefoot girl no older than the students emerged and stepped out into the sunlight, causing them to almost run into each other. Brent skidded to a halt and went pale. He swore he was seeing a ghost. Maria suddenly felt a familiar presence within her as she watched the girl come out of the cave, and she bolted over to Brent's side. The girl examined their faces for a moment as they were clearly examining her too. It took her a moment to recognize their aged faces, but there was no denying the connection she had with her sister. 
Haley took off her backpack and pulled the rock from its pocket. I told you this would bring bad luck, Brent, she said as she handed it back to him. The end. Oh, I like that. That was awesome. Oh, thank you. That's so cool. So one of my favorite mysteries in the universe are glitches in the Matrix. Yeah. And that's what that was. That's cool. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> now it's your turn. Um, mine is in first person. I actually never named the main character. Well, it's fine. <laughs> Go for it. Cool. Well, this one is named Niagara Falls Shoes. I know, very <laughs> basic, but... <laughs> I was walking through New York by the famous Niagara Falls. It was hot and humid out. There was no relief from the sun except for slight mist coming from the waterfall. You can hear kids running in dreams and joy all around me. Today is my day off. It was the first day in two weeks where I've had time for myself. I'm about 40 years old, and the only thing that I've really accomplished in my life is becoming head detective at NYPD. No one really likes me. I keep to myself, and I mostly work alone. Oh. <laughs> Some people think I'm odd for reasons I don't understand. I'm extremely observant and try to guess the next moves of others around me. Everyone has a pattern, and I can find it. I can read the body language and I can hear the voice pitch change. I keep walking and keep my distance from the people around me, but I keep watch. I'm on guard. I keep my head forward. I see a man in dark clothes running through the crowd like he's being chased. He was wearing a brown sweatshirt and black cargo pants with a chain on the side. I noticed his shoes were white with a red sole with some scuff marks on the side. The man parted the crowd like it was the Red Sea but no one was behind him. As I look upon the crowd, there was a woman standing in the back. She was wearing a paisley dress and her hair was blowing in the wind. She was emotionless. The woman looked like she was trying to figure out her next move. I continued to walk near the railing, just looking at the waterfall downward. It was mesmerizing. I stare down and see the waterfall breaking up the water underneath at a rapid pace. I couldn't stop thinking about the man earlier on. He seemed disturbed and panicked. The woman in the back also. Were they somehow connected? Do they know each other? Was it just a coincidence that they were in the same place? Maybe my mind isn't out of work completely. I just can't leave work at work. It fills my mind around the clock. I keep walking and just listening to the hustle and bustle of the people around me. I make it towards the border of Canada. I'm stuck in my thoughts still. And then suddenly I see the woman in the paisley dress from earlier. How did she get there before I did? But she looked panicked talking to the guard and she was holding a pair of white shoes with the red sole and the same scuff marks as the man was wearing from earlier. I was astonished. So many questions ran through my mind. I lingered to see if I could hear anything but everything was muffled. I started to slowly make my way over to see if I could hear anything. As I made my way over, I noticed a brown sweatshirt over the railing just hanging there. The officer was trying to calm the woman down, but he had no luck. She ran away crying, clutching the pair of shoes in her hand. I ran after her, but she was already gone by the time I rounded the corner. I looked to my left and there were two men just standing in the distance. Something didn't feel right as I watched them exchange words. The man on the right looked nervous as the other was talking. The man that was talking was on the older side and seemed to be stressed like something went wrong for him. The nervous one was on the younger side. He seemed like a grandson or a son to the older man. The arguing started to escalate to higher volumes. The younger man had enough of the screaming and started cussing out the older man. Soon enough, the older man said a few choice words and walked away from the younger man. I walk up the younger man and I said, Hey, how are you doing? What's your name? He looked at me with a concerned look on his face and said, I'm not doing well. My grandfather is an angry old man. Can't tell him anything. My name is Avery. 
I had told my grandfather that I was moving on from our family-owned business. We make shoes in an old factory, but it wasn't my dream to continue with it. And I said, oh, so it was just an argument over that? It got heated. I thought something more was going on with you two. Avery looked frustrated with that and said, the argument had been going on for years and you will not let it go. I have seen some shady stuff go on in the factory and I don't want any part of it. After he said that, it piqued my interest. I asked him if he could take me to go see it, but he refused and went on his way. I kept thinking about all the events this day. Each memory kept on passing through like a movie. I had so many questions. What happened to the woman after she ran away? What happened to the man with the shoes? Are those two connected? What about the two men arguing? Are they also connected to the other couple? I had to investigate. I go back to Niagara Falls the next day and see the crime tape along the rails in the same place as the sweatshirt was where the woman was holding the shoes. Uh oh. <laughs> I looked to my left and I saw the woman back speaking to the officer. I heard him say, you were under arrest for the murder, Jason. She starts screaming that she didn't do it, was resisting arrest until the other officer took her down. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just picturing her being like tackled. <laughs> sorry. Continue. I- <laughs> I go to the tape and see the remaining blood on the rails. I look back and notice that she had a cut on her arm that looked fresh. I asked the officer if he had tested the blood because it could be hers. He scoffed and brushed me aside and I kept walking with the other woman. Really quickly, I took a swab and brushed the cut with it and then took a separate one and tested the rail as well. I went to the lab, asked them to be tested together. It had been a couple hours and the result finally came back. It was her blood, but the other DNA came up and it said it was Jason's fingerprints on the rail. So they know each other. The DNA is similar. They must be siblings. That would explain why she was in hysterics. I go back to the crime scene, but with the team behind me. We swabbed for fingerprints. We talked to everyone and everyone to see if they had been there the day before and we ask if they have seen anything. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Avery and the other man. They look suspicious, especially Avery. I walk over and greet the both of them. I ask, Avery, do you know who this man is? He looked at me with a sad look in his eyes. He says, yes, that's Jason. He works with us in the shoe factory. I look at him with a concerned look and say, do you know what happened to him? Where did he go? What was your relationship with him? Avery looks at me and says, Jason got in trouble with my grandfather. He stole a lot of money from the business. He has had a rough childhood and my grandfather took him under his wing at a young age. Jason was improving so much through the years. Then one day, my grandfather goes into his office and sees Jason going through his safe, taking about $2,000. Oh. Oh, my. My mind was racing, hearing all these things, and it's all starting to come together. But where does the woman fit in? I ask Avery. Then who is the woman seen with him that was arrested for his murder? Then Avery says, her name is Olivia, and she is his sister. I'm also dating Olivia and hoping to marry her one day. And then it clicks. But then my cell phone rings, and it's the lab. I pick up the phone. Hello? The voice on the other side says, there's an extra pair of fingerprints that don't match Olivia. It matches a man named Joshua Sullivan. He owns the shoe factory. Oh, oh man. Okay. And from the records, Avery Sullivan is his grandson. My blood runs cold. I'm standing in front of the two people that have possibly killed Jason. I must keep it together. I turn to Joshua and ask, how do you feel about Jason being dead? I know he has stolen from you, but he was potentially going to be family. Joshua responds with a fiery look in his eye, over my dead body, he was not ever going to be. I refuse to let Avery marry Olivia. She's no better than Jason. She has a lot of problems and is not going to drag Avery down with him. She has already convinced Avery that he's not going to take over the business. 
And then it all comes together. Joshua killed Jason. It's the perfect motive. Olivia is taking Avery away, so Joshua planted the murder on her so she will be out of Avery's life. As well as getting rid of Jason because he has stolen money from him. As soon as I was about to turn to say something to Joshua, the police come and say, Joshua Sullivan, you are under arrest for the murder of Jason and for wrongfully planting evidence on another. Oof. He gets taken away with sirens blaring. I go home that night, fell asleep knowing that we finally know what happened to Jason. Two years later, I get an invite in the mail about Olivia and Avery's engagement. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> in the same letter, they tell me that the shoe factory was sold and they used the money for a beautiful service for Jason. Joshua is still in prison and may stay there for life. Oh, good for them. <laughs> yeah. Got a nice happily ever after. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. That, that was a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait, so... So who was the killer again? It was um, Avery's grandfather. Avery's grandfather. That's yeah. right. Okay. Dang. Mm -hmm. But I I was kind of picturing that like a film noir, like the like the old timey like detective shows. Oh yeah. Like black and white, and everyone talks kind of funny. That's what I was just picturing that whole time. Yeah, pretty much. Black and white. Yeah. yeah. Nice job. Thanks. Yeah. I try. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. This is a good one for our first for our first yeah. episode. Um, just so everyone knows, we will get better at reading out loud as we keep doing this. Yeah. So thank you if you've made it this far for putting up with our um, stuttering and losing our place and forgetting to breathe. Yeah, forgetting to breathe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I guess. Um, we can come up with next week's genre um, setting and challenge. Get those paper things that we made. Okay, so first we got to pick out the genre. Do you have the coconut? I have the coconut right okay. here. We have little slips of paper inside of plastic coconuts for now. So that way we can pull, pull from a coconut instead of a hat. Yeah. Oh, I just like hit the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so... Oh, am I picking it? Yeah, you're picking it. Okay, I'm not looking. Let's look at which paper we get. So, next week's genre. Oh! Mm -hmm. It's a young adult. Look at that. Yeah, so we get to write a story for for the youth. Um, for, for Gen Xers. <laughs> so we'll put that back in. Okay. For potential next. So, the setting, we have two coconuts for a setting. So, you're going to pick one. And then right. we'll shake it up and then pick one from that. I want this one. Okay. Shake it up. Okay. Do you want to announce it? Yeah. Okay. So you do. The woods. The woods. <laughs> so, so far. <laughs> All the simplicity. We start off with a specific location of Niagara Falls and now we're just in the woods. Okay. Young so, adults. In the woods. Young adults in the woods. <laughs> the worst combination. You never know what they're up to. Okay, so then this one is a special item or challenge. So Brandy's going to pick one. Okay, what does it say? <laughs> a tree? <laughs> <laughs> well, this one would be nice and easy. Because our special item is a tree. We should so, pick again. No. No? <laughs> no, we're there. keeping it. Because um, this is new, and we got to get good at it. So next episode, we will have a short story. We'll each have a short story for you all. Um, it's young adult fiction mm -hmm. um, in the woods, and we have to include a tree. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> So that'll be, that'll be fun. Yeah. Okay. So I hope you all have a great week and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening. Bye. Okay. Bye.